Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi everyone, this is the very first uh, seminar of the semester. It's my pleasure to introduce Ignat Sorko from University of North Texas. And he's gonna tell us about the divergence in causal groups. Thank you, Bunda, for invitation to speak. So yes, this talk will be about divergence in Coxter groups. And it's a joint work with uh, Paula Vidani from Louisiana, Yusra Nakvi, who is now in London, and Anne Thomas from University of Sydney. And this project started when I uh, visited University of Sydney before COVID, and now uh, we are about to upload it on archive. So I will start with uh, a little bit of background. So this talk, this work belongs to geometric group theory. That's a field of uh, which lies on the borders of geometry, topology, and group theory. And it studies groups by making them act on geometric spaces on uh, graphs and other spaces. So what are the most natural spaces the group can act, a group can act? Let's take a finitely presented group that is finite set of generators, finite set of relators, and we can build the Cayley graph, which has vertices corresponding to uh, elements of group and uh, edges respond to generators. So edge labeled with a generator connects G to GA. So group acts on this Cayley graph by isometries, namely on the left, namely it sends uh, G to XG, G A to X J and corresponding edges preserved are preserved by this action. Also, we can obtain not a graph but a two-dimensional uh, space, which is called Cayley two complex. What are what what's the difference? We take with uh, we take Cayley graph and attach two-dimensional cells to uh, this Cayley graph equivariant. That means attach it at one vertex and then spread by the action of, of the group. And the resulting space also has the property that G, our group G acts by isometries. So a good example to look at is Z times Z. That's product of a billion groups, cyclic groups, and uh, Cayley two complex. So uh, Cayley graph is just uh, an infinite lattice, which I drew here. Uh, horizontal edges correspond to generator A, vertical to generator B. Uh, and one relator corresponds to one cell. And if we attach it equivariantly, so it will fill all the uh, plane with its corpus. So we get R2 as uh, the Cayley 2 complex for this group. If we look at uh, free product of Z2 times Z3, it has presentation uh, as follows. And Cayley graph is a tree-like construction. So we have triangles corresponding to order two element A, uh, sorry, B. And we have a bygone sort of, sort of uh, double edges corresponding to the generator A of order two. And they are arranged in a tree-like construction, which essentially uh, 
uh, if we fill in the uh, two dimensional cells, the resulting tree will be a homotopy equivalent to, it will be a tree, homotopy equivalent to a tree, sorry, in that matter. Now I will talk about divergence. Let X be a one-ended geomet geodesic metric space, meaning that any two points are can be joined by a geodesic. And we take a base point E, we consider a sphere of radius R, and <clears throat> on arbitrary pairs of points on this sphere, we look at are avoidant paths. These are the paths which don't go inside the ball. They are forbidden to go inside the ball of radius R. They connect in the outside of this ball. And we look at infimum of such lengths. For example, for these two points X and Y, the shortest path which is R avoidant will be along the circle, the arc of the circle. And then we look at all possible points, pairs of points on the sphere. And the worst case is called divergence. That's uh, how long is the R avoidant path the worst case of our avoided path for the points on the sphere. In other way, one can think of it as a function of radius R, which, which is called divergence. Uh, and it measures how geodesic rays diverge at infinity. So we define divergence of group as divergence of Cayley graph, if it's one-ended. One-ended means that once we cut a compact set, any compact set, the resulting space is connected. That is necessary condition so that we can connect two points in the complement, otherwise, if they fall into disconnected components, then divergence will be an infinity. We want it to be a real number. So up to equivalence on functions, divergence does not depend on the choice of generating set. And uh, we observe that for Euclidean plane, Divergence of R2 is given by the length, the half length of circumference of radius of circle of radius R. That is pi R, a linear function. However, if we look at a similar picture in the hyperbolic plane, we see that the formula for the length of a circle involves hyperbolic side. And asymptotically, it grows exponentially in R. So we see dichotomy. For Euclidean space, this divergence is linear function. For hyperbolic space, it's exponential function. And Gromov suggested that same dichotomy should be true for more generally non-positively curved spaces, such as cat zero spaces. So what are these cat zero spaces? Uh, we look at arbitrary triangle with lengths, fixed length A, B, C. And in Euclidean space, there is a model triangle with the same length. So for any points P and Q, the corresponding length in Euclidean space should be bigger or equal. If this condition is satisfied, the space is called cat zero. And it uh, generalizes 
hyperbolic spaces and Euclidean spaces. So it's more general concept. However, Gromov expectation turned out to be false. There are examples of cat zero groups which show divergence functions which is not linear nor exponential, something in between. The first such example was built by Gersten in 1994. He came up with a group with quadratic divergence. Then Natasha Makura came up with built examples of cubic divergence and later arbitrary polynomial divergence. And I should have mentioned that up to uh, the equivalence relations on functions, which is accepted in this context, we do not uh, care about coefficient. So no matter what coefficient is there, the functions become equivalent. What matters is the power of a polynomial. So we can say it's polynomial of certain degree and constant do not matter. So we have examples of cat zero groups with divergence quadratic, cubic, and arbitrary polynomial. Very recently, Brady and Tren uh, came up with an example of even wilder behavior uh, of divergence functions. They built groups which are not cat zero themselves, but subgroups of cat zero groups with uh, divergence, a power function with this exponent power alpha uh, being irrational and dense in this interval from two to infinity. And also they came up with uh, divergence functions of the form polynomial times logarithm. So once we have such an interesting invariant of groups, a natural question is, take your favorite class of groups and what are possible divergence functions that it may have? And in this work, we look at Coxter groups. So I'll pause here and uh, ask for you to ask me some questions because I'm gonna change gear and move on to discussing Coxter groups. Do we have any anything about divergence to talk, maybe to clarify something? I guess this is a small question. The Makura's example, um, I uh, vaguely remember she had worked with the um, mapping tori of polynomial growing. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So uh, her example, as well as Gersten example, they are actually three by six. Okay. Yes, that's an interesting thing. So we take a uh, automorphism of a free uh, group and uh, form semi-direct product of cyclic group generated by this automorphism with the group. And that's how uh, they got their example. They are very nice, yeah, in particular, we have two-dimensional cat zero space for the comparison. Thanks for pertinent question right to the point. Okay, so I'll move on to considering Coxter groups. What is a Coxter group? We start with a finite set S and uh, a symmetric matrix of symbols, natural numbers starting from two, three, four, up to infinity, including infinity. And this symmetric matrix include, in, encodes a nice presentation. Namely, uh, these are the powers that corresponding generators raised to that power give one. And specific 
property is that uh, SS is one. So, which means that MSS is one. So that implies that each element has order two. So, <coughs> Traditionally, Coxter groups are encoded by a graph with some labels on edges, which is called either Dinkin diagram, Coxter graph. Well, there is a, another way to define it, uh, depending on convention, when do we not draw an edge? So if we apply this convention for Dinkin graphs, then we don't draw an edge if uh, two generators commute. Otherwise, we draw an edge. If, uh, it's a single edge if uh, corresponding power is three, double edge is four. If it's five or more, we write it explicitly. Yes, so there are nice classes of Coxter groups, for example, spherical Coxter groups, they re, uh, pretty much remind of ADE classification of uh, complex simple Lie, uh, groups, but they have some extra uh, non-crystallographic uh, cases. So it was, they were classified by Coxter himself back in 1935. And the property is that these groups are generated by reflections in the faces of a simplex in n-dimensional sphere. Then next nice class of Coxter groups are affine Coxter groups. And they are given by the so-called extended Dinkin diagrams, which uh, people who study representation theory also know and interestingly, they are the Coxter groups, which are reflection groups in the faces of a simple simplex in some uh, Euclidean space. So simplex can have different dihedral angles. They should be subquotients of pi. Uh, and uh, all possibilities when uh, we have group generated by reflections in places uh, of simplex are classified by these affine Coxter groups. One might, might ask, what are the case when we look at HN, that is uh, hyperbolic and dimensional space. And such classification exists. That's another nice class of Coxter groups were first described by Lanner, and their Coxter diagrams are given by this nice picture. So these are groups generated by reflections in the faces of a simplex in hyperbolic space, and dimensional Lobachevsky, they call it, uh, Lobachevsky space sometimes. So what are our results? Let me. Turn to this topic. Uh, so, our first part of results is the following. If we have a one ended Coxter system, what does it mean? That means that its scaly graph is a one ended space, or a more convenient space, Davis complex, is one ended. The condition for it to be one-ended is known and easy checked. So if uh, our system is irreducible and non-affine, then the divergence of W is at least quadratic. At least quadratic. So that's first theorem. And as a corollary, uh, we get a complete characterization of linear divergence. So W has linear divergence, if and only if it's a direct product of two 
Hoxter groups, where both of them are infinite, or W1 finite and W2 irreducible affine of rank bigger than three. So, why it is so? Because they obviously contain Z times Z subgroup, and that is actually uh, the true reason why the linear divergence appears. And we have a nice corollary. If one ended Coxter group has a super linear divergence, then it is at least quadratic. That means there is a gap between R and R square in this specific class of groups. It's natural to expect that this gap exists for all classes of groups for divergence because we know that certain fi similar phenomena phenomenon is true uh, for Dane function. Similar is true for Dane functions. The functions are feeling functions of one dimension more. Like divergence, but we feel circles with disks. And divergence, we feel pairs of points with arcs. So another part of our results is uh, we introduced hypergraph index, uh, which bears resembles to what Ivan Levkovitz did for right angled Coxter groups. Actually, it says generalization of his construction. So what are right angled Coxter groups? These are the Coxter groups where all uh, marks, all edge labels are either zero, sorry, not zero, either two or infinity. So uh, that's a combinatorial invariant. We compute it directly from Coxter graph. And the theorem tells if this invariant is zero, if and only if the divergence is linear. Uh, this hypergraph index is one if and only if it's quadratic. If it's finite, then divergence is bounded above by the polynomial of degree one more. And if it's infinite, then divergence is exponential also if and only if. So we conjecture and actually work uh, in that direction to prove that item three can be reversed. So that this hypergraph index actually captures the order of divergence exactly. That it's finite if and only if divergence is polynomial of degree H plus one. Uh, Levkovitz proved it for right angle Coxter, Coxter groups, and we proved it for certain infinite series, series of non right angle Coxter groups, but not for all of them. Not for all of them. So that's our work in progress. Any questions? Not uh, our Next group of results is relating uh, divergence with the topology of Coxter graph. So Betty number is essentially the rank of first homology, or if you look, say it uh, informally, uh, the number of uh, cycles in the graph, simple cycles which generate uh, homology group. So it's denoted uh, B1. And uh, if our theorem says if H is finite, then 
it is bounded by this Betty number plus one. It's computed easily, like number of edges minus number of vertices plus number of components. And as a corollary, we get that in case if a Coxeter group is not relatively hyperbolic, then the divergence is bounded above by the polynomial of degree with beta number plus two. And in case when Coxeter graph is a tree, that means uh, that the number is zero. And group is one ended, then divergence can be either linear, quadratic, or exponential, and nothing else. Moreover, these possibilities are realized, and this covers a lot of cases. Uh, because people care about Coxter groups. In most cases, they are trees, like a fine, except one group, they are all trees and other important classes. So, for example, this is an example when uh, nine gone by very labels on edges, we get different hypergraph indices. Ignore uh, the uh, red dotted lines. They are, uh, I will explain them later. But for now, look at first example. It's a, a fine group of type A8 tilde. So as a fine group of this type, it has Z8 as a subgroup of finite index that makes divergence linear and hypergraph index Z. If we change the uh, labels here to four, we get hypergraph index one. If we change them here to four, hypergraph index becomes two. And here, hypergraph index infinity. Why it is so? I will probably have time to consider one or two examples later. So let me now go to key ideas uh, of our construction. There is a result of Birchstock, Capras, Hagen, and Sisto, which proved that Coxter group is either relatively hyperbolic, then its divergence is exponential. Actually, this is if and only if. Uh, and if it's not uh, relatively hyperbolic, then it's called thick. Uh, and then its divergence, they proved it's bounded by a polynomial. The goal is to determine the exact upper bound, uh, which polynomial gives exact upper bound. And a relatively hyperbolic group, it's uh, almost hyperbolic, you can say, in, informally, <clears throat> in such a way that there is a family of peripheral subgroups which hide all manifestation of non-hyperbolicity. For example, uh, Z plus Z subgroups, they cannot be in form of hyperbolic groups. But in relatively hyperbolic groups, they can be present, but must be hidden in some of these peripheral subgroups. And also these peripheral subgroups and all their conjugates must intersect in finite subgroups. So these are two key properties of relatively hyperbolic groups. Uh, so we try to build the uh, relatively hyperbolic structure, these peripheral subgroups, 
and our rules to follow will be this one and two. We start with obvious special subgroups corresponding to subsets of vertices of defining Dinkin diagram, which contains Z plus Z. And we take the joints if they intersect infinitely, because they must intersect in the infinite subgroups. So in case they intersect in an infinite subgroup, we uh, unite them into a bigger. Once this process stops, there can, can be two outcomes. If no subgroup equals the whole group, then we get an honest peripheral structure and our group is relatively hyperbolic. So its divergence is exponential. However, if some peripheral subgroup engulfs all Coxter groups, then the Coxter group is not relatively hyperbolic, or you can say it's relatively hyperbolic in a trivial way, which is which does not count. So the Coxter group is thick, and the number of steps which we perform of this uh, process before stabilization, this is our hypergraph index. It measures the complexity in a way of obtaining this, of exhausting the whole group by trying to build a peripheral structure starting from smallest possible special uh, subgroups which contain the plus and then divergence will be bound by the polynomial of one more degree so more formally we uh, define wide subsets these are maximal uh, subsets of generators uh, recall that s is uh, set of generators like S1, S2, S3, S4, like that. So maximum sets, subsets of uh, this, let this set S of the form, uh, something times another something. And this something are both those spherical or irreducible affine of rent bigger than three. Why do we need these cases? Because these are uh, the cases which obviously contain Z plus Z subgroups. So if we have Z plus Z subgroups, they should be hidden in the peripheral subgroups. So we start with this wide subsets as a candidate for peripheral subgroups. And then there is another uh, cool uh, question. Yeah. So you here you require the elements in the A and the B commuting, right? They should be commuting, yes. So they should be disjoint in the Inkin diagram, no edges between them, or you can say that all edges are two. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, another tool is slab subsets, which are maximal sets of the form A times K, where A minimal non spherical and K maximal non spherical maximal not empty spherical commuting with a it's a little technical uh, condition but uh, what do they and maximal that means there there is no t in previous sets such that they lie in such t so this is a tool to detect when two peripheral subgroups intersect in an infinite subgroup. 
So we take care of conditions one and two from previous page. Now we take the union and inductively continue, uh, build sets lambda i, which are all unions of elements in a equivalence class, which is generated by a condition intersection of two members is non-spherical. So we get bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger subsets within the uh, defining set of the Coxter group. And sooner or later, it will stabilize because we have finite uh, many generators. So if we reach the situation when the whole generating set is in certain element of this hierarchy, then this is the step at which this happens is our hypergraphic. Otherwise, it's infinite. Such a technical condition, but we prove that it actually uh, a very natural thing in the sense that it captures the divergence from above for all Coxter groups, for below it's conjectural and for certain classes it also captures lower bound for divergence for certain classes like right angle Coxter groups by results of Lefkowitz and certain other classes which we prove and conjecture is that it captures it for all Coxter groups. Now I will uh, look at uh, one example. For example, this what we seen before. Why the hypergraph index is infinite here? Uh, let's look at complement for this two element set. So we have this and this subset. So if we look at it, it is of the form irreducible affine of C3 tilde times C2 tilde. So they contain Z times Z subgroup. Uh, so this should be a peripheral subgroup. This should be a candidate for peripheral subgroup. Okay. Similarly, for complement of this set, it also contains Z plus Z subgroup, so T2 and T3. However, they intersect uh, in a spherical, finite, Subgroup. So they give us an honest peripheral structure. So this three subgroups generated by this uh, three subsets of generators is uh, peripheral structure for this uh, relatively hyperbolic group. So it's an honest relatively hyperbolic group with peripheral subgroups generated by uh, this three elements. And as such, relatively hyperbolic group have in exponential divergence, and our hypergraph index is in considered infinite. On the contrary, the examples which I showed before, uh, if we look at, for example, complement of these two sets, it is this times this. So it has again z times z in it. So we have one such thing, another such thing, and their intersection now infinite. So that means that they should be engulfed into a bigger peripheral structure. And if we take the union, it is all of generating set. So we had used only one union operation. 
and we reached all of s. Therefore, hypergraph index is one, so divergence is quadratic. And in that case, uh, we have similar situation. If we cut this way, we have z plus z. If we cut this way, we have a subgroup which has z plus z. And their union is, sorry, their intersection is non-spherical. So their union is everything except uh, this vertex. So this bigger sub group. However, there is a third set, which is infinite affine times singleton set. And uniting with this set, we get the whole generator set in two steps. So hypergraph index is two and divergence is bounded above by a polynomial of degree three. Conjecturally, it is equal to uh, cubical function, but we right now able only to prove the upper bound. And that's what I prepared for today. <clears throat> so I'll pause here for questions. You have algorithms for deciding the various cases from the Cox graph. Okay, can you say it again? Do you have algorithms um, for deciding uh, what can happen uh, just from the, the Cox graph? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question, but this hypergraph index, we, uh... ah, you're asking yeah. what are the reasons that- No, can... I mean, uh, just for, okay, you start from the cost graph. Uh, so there's an algorithm. So given the cost graph, input is the cost graph, then you, okay, pair. Uh, what can happen uh, in terms of the this uh, head graph index? Is that the mean of that? Uh... We have this uh, result. Uh, divergence is bounded by the topology of Coxeter graph. Yeah. So you take number of this petty number plus two. And that's the upper bound for divergence. So okay. we can, and in, in, in general, this hypergraph index, we read it off from uh, combinatorics of Coxeter graph. So we work with special subgroups. Sometimes they call it parabolic subgroups. Yes. So it's not like, uh, anything else, just combinatorics of uh, special subgroups of subsets of generated sets. But this result is sort of unexpected uh, that complexity, topological complexity of uh, Coxeter graph itself gives us the upper bound for the divergence. Well, in a way it, it is, supposed to be that way, right? So the more complicated group, the should, group should be complicated to exhibit some complicated behavior. So geometrically, the hypergraph index, I mean, at least in the case of a right angle, the Cox group is, uh, Yes. It has something to do with the maximum flat, right? In the session, maximum flat. Maximum flat. 
so maximum the, flats in the maximum flat flat yeah all right uh, So flats do play a role, but uh, there is a more complicated interplay. For example, if you take any product of two spaces, the divergence will be linear. Right, okay. Yes. Okay, so the, yeah. The, the, flat, the flat case can correspond to the FI special. Okay. Yes, yes. A fine have a product like Zn of finite index. So divergence is a quasi isomorphic yeah. invariant. So finite index is okay, not. So you have this case. To, yeah. Yes. Also, uh, e yes. Also, if it's a disjoint union of two infinite groups, it corresponds to direct product of that. So divergence right. yeah, of that's, any. That's right. Yeah space which is a direct product is linear and this is an easy proof one can that's product, yeah. Anyone else has questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I just didn't realize that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he um, ended, sorry. Um, thank you, Ignat, again. I'm just gonna just stop the recording and then I'm gonna ask a question. Oh no, ask, ask <laughs> <one>. <laughs> I, I mean, I totally missed 